Right, so as various Western politicians queue up to expose themselves as absolute raging hypocrites after months of saying Israel has a right to defend itself, but Iran apparently doesn't, it isn't Iran that is being looked at right now as the likely cause of the aggression between the two nations continuing, having said their business with Israel is now concluded. But with Israel and Netanyahu instead ramping matters up again, and with those same hypocritical leaders and their biased media mates singing from the same hymn sheet that the attack from Iran was unprovoked, they are escalating and enabling Israel to say they would be right to respond even if, behind closed doors, the likes of genocide Joe Biden are telling Netanyahu to take the win they've got, referring to the fact Iran basically let them off lightly, considering the armaments they could have brought to bear should they have chosen to. The thing is, the cost of Israel's defence of that night has now come to light, and compared to the cost to Iran, based on the benefits that Iran have gained from this action themselves, well, frankly, if Bibi wants a full-on war, who's going to pay for it? Because he might not be able to. Right, so now that Iran has expressed its right to defend itself following the unprovoked targeting of the Iranian consulate in Damascus, as the dust settles and Israel assesses the damage we know they've sustained, even if they deny it, because we've all seen footage, I'm sure, on social media of rockets making it past Israeli defence systems and finding their way to the apparently military targets they were destined for. The question now hanging in the air is whether Israel got the message or whether they decide again to retaliate against Iran. Iran are saying they now consider the matter closed, draw a line under it, Israel having targeted their embassy in Syria, killing 13 people there. Israel deemed it a military target because of who was there. But if embassies can now be considered military targets every time certain people visit them, military targets, shall we say, it sets an incredibly dangerous precedent. And it is, of course, in violation of the Vienna Convention of 1961, which protects diplomatic buildings and embassies. They are not and never should be designated targets. Yet Israel apparently did this violating that convention, and Iran responded in turn. Drone attacks, ballistic and cruise missiles were fired, Israel's Iron Dome defence system took a beating, as did aircraft countering these strikes, putting down the vast majority of these inbound targets, but not all of them. Some of them got through and some of them caused damage. There's also been significant debate over Iran's strategy here, having opted for a, a relatively slow-paced attack, as, being, as has been commented on. Giving Israel plenty of time to respond, it appears, showing not only an apparent desire not to escalate, certainly in keeping with Iranian narratives ahead of the attack over the last several days, but nor to cause dramatic widespread actual damage either, by giving plenty of opportunity for Israel and its allies to counter those attacks. Giving Iran the ability to say, despite the much greater amount of ordnance fired that their response to Israel's earlier attack was proportional. Now, you can make the arguments for or against that as you desire. Goodness knows plenty of our politicians are queuing up at the moment to get on the TV and do so. That is the end result of where we are, though. Iran is satisfied that things are even between them and Israel. According to them, they're done. Obviously, if they attack again now, that's a different story. Unless, of course, it's in response to another Israeli attack, a retaliation which I think is far more likely. Now, Netanyahu has been told to take the win by Biden, and this was apparently reiterated in a phone call late last night between the US and Israel, the US saying they will not get involved if Israel take another swipe at Iran. Of course, we know this is what Netanyahu really wants, but if he's told in no uncertain terms it is definitely off the table, the smart move would be to listen. He's not been big on that of late, though, has he? He might well, far more likely, I think, be arrogant enough to think either he's strong enough on his own to deal with Iran and who needs Biden, or if he goes for it anyway, if push comes to shove, the US will have his back regardless of what Biden says. That's not to say money isn't going to keep flowing from the US or arms to Israel, however, as this excerpt from Al Jazeera this morning implies, certainly on the money side of things. The United States will not participate in any Israeli counteroffensive against Iran, President Joe Biden has told Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, according to US officials. The reported declaration came in a phone call between the leaders late on Sunday as Israel mulls its response to Iran's air attack the previous day. Despite the US president joining global calls for restraint, the rising tensions in the Middle East appear to be set to accelerate approval of a stalled funding package that would see Washington hand Netanyahu $14 billion in aid. That, of course, is part of that $60 billion aid package still currently held up in Congress, is the inference, I believe, 
is, is what that article is getting at, if that ever gets passed. More money from the U.S. to Israel, though, and of course, arms sales continue as well. So despite the words of the U.S. here, they continue to provide the weaponry and the finance to keep this going if Israel is minded to do so. Keep this in mind. It's relevant going forwards. And the one thing I haven't come to yet, the crux of this video, as per the title, is Israel's ability to pay its way in its warmongering. According to the IMF, Israel has the 28th largest economy with an annual GDP for the last year of 521 billion US dollars. So you can appreciate the aid being sent to Israel by the US on the scale it has, has been in the billions uh, of dollars and is still planned is, is quite insane. It's, it's quite the proportion of what Israel makes for itself. Though, of course, with the Red Sea blockaded right now, trade is interrupted. Much of Israel's economy is dependent on foreign trade. So they could be taking quite a dent right now economically in the pocket. So priorities for them really should be important. Should be putting people first instead of raising Gaza to the ground or committing genocide or being engaged in warfare with Lebanon and Syria and now Iran as well, perhaps. Why would they want another expensive engagement that is totally avoidable? Well, if US public money is paying for it all, then he's being enabled to, isn't he? But now we know the cost of Israel's defence against that limited strike by Iran. Now, you might think I'm a bit mad for referring to it as that, but Iran could have thrown a lot more at Israel at a much greater rate if it wanted to. This response to the Israeli attack on their embassy was restrained, in my view. And there's a reason for that, too. To Iran's benefit, but the defence of Israel against what Iran threw at it on Saturday night into Sunday morning our time, came in at an astonishing price tag of four to five billion shekels, equivalent to around 1.3 billion US dollars. That's according to an economic advisor to a former IDF chief of staff called Ram Amanak. That new aid package of Biden's, it'll get eaten up very, very quickly at that rate, especially since the next attack from Iran would be guaranteed to be a lot worse. This is what I mean by Israel's ability to afford to keep fighting Iran. Because unless the US, and by that I mean US citizens, putting the bill for it, how can Israel possibly afford to keep going at that rate? If they need aid packages, financial ones like this from elsewhere, as they keep on getting, especially from the US, clearly they cannot afford it, cannot afford what they're doing. That's the obvious inference to draw from this, isn't it? If the US stopped this aid, then Israel would have to stop its actions everywhere, including Gaza. So who are the enablers and escalators of this situation if it isn't the US and the Biden administration? But if we look at the cost to Iran in turn, with the majority of what they sent Israel's way being drones, which are relatively cheap ordnance, although I've not been able to find any particular figures as I have for Israel, it's almost certainly going to be lower. However, their gains, their benefits from this action may be measured in more than purely monetary terms here as well. Iran is a much smaller economy than Israel's. They're the 41st largest economy in the world. Annual GDP for Iran is around 366 billion US dollars. And it's not doing brilliantly right now as its currency is taking a bit of a battering. But like I say, it's not all in purely monetary terms that Iran have made gains here. And going forwards, if Israel insists on going there, they don't need to spend much to make matters an awful lot worse for Israel. First off, Iran have just conducted their largest and furthest ranging missile and drone test ever, if you look at this action in that way. Israel gave them the excuse to do this, to try all this, so they now know more about their own capabilities. Iran is known to have a wide range of weaponry at its disposal, yet chose not to use anything that hasn't already been seen before. So Israel and its allies have learned absolutely nothing of Iran's additional capacity. In turn, however, Iran will have learned a lot about Israel's capabilities. Israel have paid a huge strategic cost here, not just a monetary cost, a strategic cost, because in their response to this wide-ranging Iranian attack, they've revealed their own defence capabilities. They've revealed what their missile defence system looks like in action. They've revealed where their defence installations are, along with bases being used by allies in neighbouring nations, such as the US installations in Iraq or Jordan. All of this intelligence can be gathered and make the next attack that much more forceful and effective. Everything about Iran's attack screams intelligence gathering exercise. Next time their money will go a lot further in its effects, but obviously this is only in the assumption that Israel asked for it. But this isn't the only cost to Israel. Iran can do more damage than just targeting them with weapons. They've just seized 
that ship, the MSC Ares in the Strait of Hormuz, Israeli-owned ship. Therefore, they can make that stretch of water completely impassable to Israeli shipping in a way Yemen could only dream of, frankly. And it's just a waterway that carries 30% of the world's global oil shipping, causing significant further economic grief than that the Houthis are already inflicting in the Red Sea. If Israel insists on carrying on, it is going to cost them dearly, both economically and militarily, and will also cost those who continue to aid them. And the only way they could possibly keep going is if Joe Biden keeps America's checkbook open and keeps signing those blank checks. Now, this escalation in Middle East tensions, all stemming from Israel committing genocide in Gaza, is being driven by Israel and those funding it is beyond dispute. It's not Iran driving this. It isn't Iran acting in an unprovoked, warmongering manner. It is Israel and those governments insisting on backing them up. Iran does have a right to self-defense and has exercised that right. As this video recommendation explains all about how we got here, and I'll hopefully catch you on the next video. Cheers, folks.